happy. Now we can start. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody, and each one of you. Um, this is an event uh, dedicated to the culturalism and populism that is co organized by the Interthematic Group for Migration here at SESH, together with uh, the research project The Othering. And uh, is an event that uh, is part of a series of, tip of events uh, to discuss and debate rights and uh, migrations uh, from different perspectives. Um, this event um, is the second of the series. The first was dedicated to borders. <coughs> the, the rest of the events are dedicated to middle passages with Gaia Giuliani, who is here and is also the PI of uh, the other project, a member of the ITM on the 19th of February, in the same room at uh, the same time, or half an hour before, maybe, <laughs> that you can check online. The fourth event is going to be dedicated to humanitarianism, and it's already scheduled by the 30th of March, 2020, with um, Martina Pazzioli. And then we will have four more events in uh, April, May, and then in the rest of the year, dedicated to representations, violence, operation of bio-borders, and counter-narrative. This last event is going to be an international <coughs> workshop uh, where um, different perspectives will be at play, but especially those of uh, migrants and uh, people that uh, leave migration not as a crisis for Europe, but uh, <coughs> The organizing committee of migrating rights, keywords, is uh, here listed. Alda Portugal, Carla Panico, Clara Keating, also here with us. Myself, Fatima Velez, from Geography, uh, here, the Faculty of uh, Humanities. Gaia Giuliani, Gisela Almeida, Joana Sosa Ribeiro. Marilena Indelicado is going also to sit in this round table, Silvia Viegas and Silvia Rock. The ITM is much bigger than this, and uh, um, it's a team that works in, uh, based on uh, activities. So these are the people that uh, are organizing this event, but other people are organizing other events. The logic of migrating rights is to discuss uh, what are human rights in relation to migration after we last year commemorated the 70th anniversary of uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to which the ITM dedicated a uh, one year of uh, publications and events uh, that you can um, find published in the Alice News for instance. Uh, we organized our first event in uh, December 2018 to start the commemoration and uh, the event, the first event of this series, Borders, uh, was dedicated to, to give continuation to this initiative. Uh, because we thought that, uh, of course, the debate was not over, apart from that, and we wanted to continue and contextualize it it otherwise. So we gave it another year of, you know, uh, thinking uh, through these keywords, which is uh, what we are doing during 2020, actually, and uh, probably next year we will see what what's next. So to come into this event is a round table. Well, the series have, have different formats. Uh, we have this as a round table as the first one, was a round <coughs> table as well. Next two events are going to be closer to lecture, uh, where we have a speaker with some discussions. So the, the format is uh, variated. But in this event, we wanted to put together two key themes that are um, very related to migration in terms of uh, how we see uh, migrants and uh, how we deal with migrants in Europe and uh, how ourselves <coughs> Uh, feel and live uh, the tension between uh, nationalism and uh, 
spirit of humanity that we all uh, live in. So that's why interculturalism and populism. We know populism, and we have specialists of the, uh, on this issue here um, that are going to elaborate more on, on, on populism, is the political label, to say the most, uh, you know, accepted uh, uh, use of the term, is the political label used to identify a certain type of politics in Europe and elsewhere, of course, uh, in order for us to debate the topic of populism not as a Eurocentric perspective, we also have a uh, uh, perspective from uh, outside Europe and especially from India, but also we have perspectives that are not Eurocentric within Europe and we will see what I mean by that. So this event was dedicated to understand the relation between nationhood and, uh, uh, and the state. Migration uh, or migrations uh, is something that uh, <coughs> put nationhood uh, into question. What does it mean? Where it leads to? And we will debate it from uh, the intercultural perspective, trying to understand what is the difference between intercultural, multicultural, transcultural, and we also invited someone who is very much uh, able to talk about that, but we will also speak about interculturalism from a critical perspective, meaning that this may not be uh, a clear-cut solution uh, to the issue of uh, state-centric nationalism. So the speakers of this round table are Luca Manucci, researcher at uh, the Institute for Social Sciences of the University of, of Lisbon, uh, ECS, where he also integrates the research um, project, Rethinking Populism. I'm going to introduce to you all of them now, so that uh, they can turn, they are five, so they can uh, swiftly uh, come here to, without spending too much time during the transition. And he is um, also very interested in topics related to authoritarian <coughs> regimes and, uh, and populism. Manuela Guillerme is uh, one of the senior scholars of SESH. She is at SESH since uh, 2002, and she works on uh, intercultural education uh, and uh, interculturalism, interculturality, and transculturality from different angles. So she is going to elaborate more on this. Amit Singh is a PhD student uh, here in Coimbra at SESH with, within the program of uh, human rights. Um, and he also integrates the um, research uh, center for the study of Indian, Indian language and society in Varanasi. Uh, then we have uh, Naki Garno, who is uh, uh, just arrived and welcome. Um, he is um, passionate for history and is actually challenging the way we see history in Lisbon and, and in Portugal in general from a decolonial uh, anti-racial perspective. And he has uh, invented uh, the African uh, tours of Lisbon, which is giving a different perspective to the city, <coughs> to the history of the city and to the current population and the current life of the city, uh, therefore giving a very inside perspective from an intercultural point of view. And finally, we have uh, Marilene Delicado is uh, going to be uh, a researcher at SESH uh, in a few months, since she, she just won the, the um, FCT uh, of course. <laughs> Uh, and she works, um, well actually her project is called a Geneal Genealogy of Anti-Racism, Cultural Anthropology, Race, Displacement and Knowledge trans uh, Transliteration, sorry for, for reading it badly. Uh, and she is very keen on uh, interculturalism from a critical anti-racist perspective. So I welcome Luca as the first speaker and who is going to talk about populism. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Cristiano and Marilena, for uh, the invitation. And 
I have to admit I did not know what to talk about today uh, until I thought about it, because Cristiano told me that they wanted something on the issues he just described, and my focus is more on populism. <coughs> But I will try to put the two uh, together and give you a speech about right-wing populism and the nation, because this is what uh, we are here to talk about today. So very briefly, I introduce the overview of the presentation. I will tell you what I mean when I talk of populism, what we are talking about. Uh, divide between three typologies of populism, economic, political and cultural populism and then give you three examples of what right-wing populism does when uh, nationalist ideology and populist <coughs> rhetoric are combined, and then we'll talk about Orban in Hungary, the Swiss People Party, and Salvini in Italy, and then we'll also talk about how the discourse of the far right, of the populist far right, has become normalized and mainstreamed uh, all over Europe. Here you can see uh, two classic populist politicians. On the left there is Marine Le Pen uh, of the uh, Rassemblement National, uh, which is a right-wing populist party, and uh, Pablo Iglesias from Podemos in, in Spain, who uh, is a left-wing populist. And this is, this is exactly where a lot of confusion about populism comes from, because we are talking about different phenomena, different discourses. These two uh, populist actors have nothing in common apart from the fact that they articulate a populist vision of society. But one is far right and one is uh, radical left. So when we talk about populism, what I mean is a thin ideology that separates society between the pure people and the corrupt elite. It's called thin ideology because per se it's not a really full ideology. It becomes a full, it's normally associated with full ideologies such as socialism, nativism, uh, liberalism, and so on and so forth. Um, meaning that as soon as the thin ideology of populism is associated with a full ideology, it becomes clear who the people are, the pure people, and who the corrupt elites um, are. Um, again, Podemos and the uh, Front National, which now has been relabeled Rassemblement National, have only one thing in common, their populist rhetoric. But they do uh, talk of the people in different ways, and they talk about the elites in different ways. In particular, we can distinguish between three typologies uh, of, of how populism operates a distinction between the people and the elite. The political conception identifies the people with the demos. Everybody is part of the people and the elites are political elites. And the, this is a sort of inclusive type of populism because it separates society including all the people and the elites. But then it can be also articulated through economic lines, like Podemos does. Uh, it's a fight between the poor people and the rich people, between the common people with few money, the working class and so on, and the powerful economic elites, like um, European institutions uh, and so on. And this is normally the populist discourse used by left-wing actors. And finally, this is what we're going to talk about today. There is a cultural uh, idea. Uh, of populism, which separates the people between, in an ethnic way. So there are the true Portuguese, the true Italians, the true Hindu, we will talk about that later, and, and all the others. And the elites are <coughs> those who um, want to have an intercultural, multicultural society, but these uh, right-wing populists don't want this to happen. And so divide society along a cultural line. So, this is what we're talking about now, the last uh, type of populism I just talked about, that separates society along a cultural line, an ethnic line. Um, the point is that when we talk about populism, we tend to confuse um, different phenomena. The point is that yes, Podemos and uh, Rassemblement National use a populist rhetoric, but they couldn't be more different as, as political parties. The point is that, especially in Europe, and especially in the last 20-30 years, populism has been articulated mostly in the cultural way I just described, meaning by right-wing or far-right uh, political actors. 
But populism is not nationalism, populism is not fascism, populism is not the synonymous, the synonymous of far right. These are different concepts, but since populism is a thin ideology, it gets associated with a full ideology, which more often than not, in Europe recently, it's a nationalist ideology. So I will give you three examples of what happens when you combine a populist <coughs> ideology with a nativist, nationalistic ideology. Um, I will talk about Orban, uh, the Swiss People Party, and Salvini, because I believe that these are three recent and meaningful examples of what happens when a populist rhetoric is inflated with nationalistic overtones. Here we have the news, I think, from literally a week ago, in which Orban, um, Prime Minister of, of Hungary, um, started talking about the Great Replacement Theory. It's a classic far-right conspiracy theory, which claims that Europeans are ethnically substituted by migrants from the Middle East and North Africa, um, and that the Hungarian government, according to Orban, should worry about this and about making Hungarians have children rather than uh, dealing with uh, migrants or trying to, to integrate them. As you can read, maybe not, it says, um, procreate or face extinction. That is the message from Central European leaders to their shrinking populations. Uh, as across the region, right-wing governments implement so-called family-first <coughs> policies. Um, this is an example of what can happen when populist rhetoric and nationalist rhetoric uh, go together. Other examples are what Salvini is uh, doing in Italy. As you might or might not read, this article starts by saying, Italy's far-right le uh, leader Matteo Salvini, looking to avoid trial for alleged kidnapping, has defended his decision to detain migrants on a Coast Guard boat last July. So, I don't know if you're familiar with what happened, but a boat full of migrants tried to reach Italian ports and Salvini, as the Minister of Interior, denied uh, the boat from reaching the coast of Italy. These people have been on a boat with no food or drinks for one week. And now he has to face trial for kidnapping. Um, the point is that right now it is not such a big deal because he did what he promised to do during the electoral campaign his claim was exactly this let's stop the migrants from coming whatever it costs and now his line of defense is well i did what i promised and i did what the government agreed to do um last but not least maybe you're not familiar with switzerland but i spent a great deal of time there and uh, i keep following Swiss politics, which is more often than not quite hilarious because they vote every three months on a wide range of referenda. Every three months Swiss people have to vote on four different national referenda plus local ones. And well, they, the SVP, Swiss People Party, wants to uh, stop the free circulation of people from the European Union which is against all the bilateral agreements that Switzerland signed with the uh, European Union. And on, in May, <coughs> next May, there will be a vote exactly on this issue. And I also put Switzerland because I think it's interesting to notice that it's not true that um, populism is only successful in countries with a great deal of corruption or a, a terrible economic situation. Switzerland is one of the richest countries in the world. and. Uh, Corruption is incredibly low compared to any other country. So populism, and especially right-wing populism, talk to people independently from the levels of corruption or uh, the, the economic situation. And even more worryingly, what I'm going to talk next is the fact that far-right politics has been normalized to the point that even mainstream actors uh, repropose the same discourse as Salvini, as Orban, and this is increasingly normal. Uh, this is Emmanuel Macron, um, who wants to set quotas for migrant workers um, in an apparent attempt to appeal to right-wing voters. So, whether populist actors win or not elections, what I wanted you to understand is that their discourse the proposals they put forward are so much mainstream, so much normalized than even centrist political actors, in order to gain votes from the far right, arrive to propose exactly 
the same policies. And this is a bit older, uh, the, the one with Angela Merkel, but <coughs> already in 2011, Angela Merkel said that multiculturalism failed in Germany. So <coughs> it's essential to understand that populism can be, yes, both right and left, but most of all, right-wing populist ideas have percolated so deeply in our societies, in our culture, that even mainstream political actors put forward uh, similar types of messages. Now, Portugal is, is probably a big exception in this regard, and indeed, as Cristiano was mentioning, I'm here to work on a project about populism in Portugal and Spain to understand what's wrong with Portugal or what's right with Portugal, in the sense that you just elected for the first time in your democratic history a far-right uh, populist actor, Andre Ventura, uh, but he remains alone in the parliament, and this is quite unusual uh, if we look at Europe at least, but honestly, also at the global level, we will talk about India, and we could talk about many other cases. So in conclusion, I wanted to point out just a few thoughts that we can discuss <coughs> further during the Q&A session. But the point is that, why is populism acceptable in certain countries but not in others? What differentiates Portugal from Spain, for example. Uh, why Vox now has 13% of the votes and uh, Chega 1.3, 10 times less? Uh, is it a matter of economy? Is it a matter of corruption? Is, wh what is it? We, we should investigate exactly why populist discourses are more or less acceptable in a country compared to another. And this is uh, a book that came out a week ago that I wrote about uh, the link between populism and collective memory, because my argument is that Populist discourses are more acceptable when a country did not deal correctly with its memory of the fascist past. Meaning, and Italy is a very famous example of that, uh, meaning that the fascist idea of power uh, is not stigmatized enough and this leaves open the space for right-wing populist <coughs> ideas to become successful in, uh, in a country. So we will discuss these and other issues if you want during the Q&A and that's all for the moment. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be very quick and uh, I'm not going to uh, follow my slides very carefully. I would like uh, just to prompt some discussion and some debates. Um, and I've been working mainly, uh, the core of my work is a conceptual discussion. That's why I bring this. And uh, it's uh, interesting because Luca mentioned that uh, Merkel and Cameron said multiculturalism uh, is bad. Is, and so what do they mean by multiculturalism? That's essential. What, what do people mean with words? Uh, <coughs> so we have uh, transcultural, uh, multicultural, different prefixes, different suffixes, and this is my uh, perception. Uh, these words mean different things to different people, to different countries, uh, uh, ideologically, politically, uh, <coughs> ethnically, philosophically, and uh, um, the way I understand it, it uh, has to do with colonial, or the colonial mat matrices reflect uh, the perceptions of uh, these concepts. And uh, <coughs> um, multiculturalism is, uh, has very much to do with the in English-speaking uh, colonial matrix and multiculturalism, where segregation is was more present and it still is it's a different uh, uh, social structure that you can see and the, the countries in europe uh, the colonial ones and the other ones reflect their perceptions of cultural diversity and how uh, different people live together in different ways of how uh, they uh, mix, interact, etc. And Portuguese and Spanish speaking colonial matrix um, work uh, on, uh, were built more in uh, inter 
called with the nature culture perspective. <clears throat> does, this does not mean that one is better than the other. It means that it is different. And uh, I saw that because in uh, one uh, uh, project, European project, uh, in uh, the beginning of this century, uh, it was very common to, for the Portuguese and uh, Spanish teachers <coughs> to understand what intercultural meant. And this was, uh, it sounded very strange uh, in Great Britain or in Germany or in Denmark, which were partners. Okay, and then the transcultural is uh, uh, still a big question because uh, colleagues in different places, in different countries, in different regions, use it in different ways. <coughs> okay, so it depends on <coughs> our locus of enunciation. Where, where, where do you stand? And you don't, where you stand is not a stable identity, and uh, so it depends on many things. <coughs> My locus of enunciation is very much linked with English-speaking countries and Portuguese-speaking countries. I started here in Mozambique, then I came to Portugal, then uh, to the United States. The, you know, life and, uh, and work, research work. And then uh, uh, England and Europe and the last decade in, in Latin America. All what I say is, you know, uh, from what I've seen. Okay, so very quickly, uh, these concepts are deeply rooted in cultural traditions and ontological standpoints, and they depend on uh, many uh, situational and chronological um, inputs. <coughs> So they are not universal signifiers, and uh, its use implies to be aware not only of their elasticity, but also of the multiple personal identities, the epistemological traditions, and if this is the case, on the academic background of their users. So these are uh, the, my recent publications uh, which talk about this. About the, the title of this session is Interculturalism. <coughs> so why not multiculturalism? Why not interculturality? I believe this is a very good question. The multiculturalism-interculturalism debate uh, has been very intense. Was, I must say. Uh, now he doesn't even have a debate about that in, in the UK. So, uh, Mudut, for example, was against uh, uh, this uh, concept of interculturalism. He uh, uh, agrees more with multiculturalism. I find that interculturalism and multiculturalism are almost synonyms uh, as they see it. Um, not for Mudud. Mudud <coughs> believes that they are uh, totally different. But for them, interculturality is, uh, I would say, something, as Cantor uh, uh, says, something used in the continent. It's foreign. <coughs> uh, uh, it, is, it is new to the English uh, language. So it's easier in English to find interculturalism because it sounds something similar to multiculturalism. Uh, so I prefer to use uh, interculturalidad or interculturalidad in Portuguese. I, I think that interculturality, which is now <coughs> starting to be used, is a translation. But the meaning <coughs> is most often more similar to interculturalism than to interculturalidad or interculturalidad. So it also depends on languages. Uh, 
Uh, okay, transcultural. I believe that like uh, the word integration, because in Germany, as far as citizenship education is concerned, uh, it was in the, I would say, yeah, uh, not last decade, the decade before, it was very popular to use the word integration. And integration, it was great. Because, you know, you could mean assimilation or, uh, you know, a, a pluralism. But uh, you never knew you could adapt. It was very flexible. So, because it was flexible, it was very comfortable. And uh, it's the same with the term transcultural, translanguaging, translanguage now. Uh, you avoid, you know, the, the conflicting uh, meanings of uh, interculturalism or multiculturalism. <clears throat> also, there is this discussion about interculturality or interculturalism because it's not critical, not political in, uh, intensive and thick. And uh, uh, Luca used the word in ideology, okay? So, <clears throat> and I, I tend to disagree because I, I adopt very much uh, the, you know, the argument, the Catherine Wolf's uh, argument about critical interculturality. Uh, so, uh, but in Latin America, the word transcultural <coughs> is, uh, has been used in a different way. Uh, it's mainly to focus on hybridization. Uh, so it, it, from Esterman, for example, Esterman is Swiss, but he has been working in Bolivia. So they use uh, this word transcultural more with the idea of, uh, you know, with the concept of hybridization. Uh, okay, <coughs> so I find I do not adopt intercultural because I'm uh, excluding multicultural or transcultural. I believe they mean different things, even though they are not stable concepts, uh, but they are complementary. And we have to consider the diachronic perspective and the synchronic perspective and take an interdisciplinary approach. Okay, critical intercultural awareness. Uh, I find this from uh, for education uh, is uh, very important. Um, <clears throat> this was okay. So I have introduced another other concept, which is local languages, and I I'm working on intercultural responsibility, which uh, I find complementary. To intercultural competence. Um, it's not, uh, uh, I would say, <coughs> one versus the other as the local language to lingua franca, but uh, it goes well beyond. Okay, so about populism. I don't know much about <coughs> populism. I enjoyed very much. Look at it. But how does it relate to multicultural, intercultural, and transcultural? I find this discussion is, is very important for me. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me because it helped me to work with it. How does democracy stand in, in, in this, you know, uh, situation of uh, this contradiction of populism and uh, interculturalism? Resentments of the everyman, charismatic politicians, fear, authoritarianism, demagogy. Okay, so <coughs> this is all we for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mara. I am going to talk about interculturalism and populism in Indian context specifically. If one word that could define India is the diversity. As you know, India is one of the most religiously and ethnically diverse countries in the world. 
Diversity is a long standing. It's not a product of recent migration like in the Western democracy. So how government of India has been managing this deep diversity? So I am going to talk about three things in my presentation. Management of population and the rise of right wing populism and the alternatives. So in the first part of my presentation, I would say pluralism is a concept that has been driven government of India to managing this diverse population. Pluralism is a system, is a concept where two different groups or ideas or principles coexist peacefully. So this has been a guiding line for the constitution of India also to, in, in order to manage this huge diversity. India is a Hindu majority country but also third largest number of Muslim population lives in India along with other diverse religions. So <coughs> there has been, all this diverse group has been deciding together since centuries. So they live together and in this process they have a, a developed a kind of a inter, very close intercultural dialogue which has resulted in syncretic culture. When I call syncretic culture is the fusion of two different ideas and ideology which which result in a particular product, like a Urdu is a language which comes when Hindu and Muslim soldiers work together. So it produced a, a, a separate language called Urdu. So this syncretic culture has been uh, reflected in the music, food, culture and art, art uh, architecture. So diversity cannot be basically separated. It has become a very essential part of Indian culture. So this diversity has been also well accommodated in Indian constitution which is secular in nature <coughs> and it provides special protection to minorities and its tribal. When I say special protection it means the minorities, specifically religious minorities has a freedom of uh, religion, freedom of expression and also government do not intervene in their religious matter. Rather, they intervene in Hindutva, in Hindu religion, but not in other religion. And this has also infuriated Hindu fundamentalists, which has become a cause for the rise of right-wing populism later on. So government so far also supported religious more, uh, minority in terms of uh, providing them subsidies, funding to their education. They allowed, allow them to preserve their particular culture. But Hindu fundamentalists blame secular party, secular parties in like Congress, leftist, communist, human rights defender. So Hindu fundamentalists told them that they are, these parties are taking the sides of minority over the, uh, <coughs> over the majority. So this, this particular idea, appeasement of the Muslims have become a, have become a, a point of a struggle between secular and non-secular. So Hindu fundamentalists known as Hindutva. Hindutva is a political form of a Hindu nationalism which talks about India belongs to Hindu. So in the dream, in the world of Hindutva, except Hindus, other religious minorities, example Muslims and Christians have a second class of citizenship role. They, they are hegemonic and they do not allow other religion to work together or to coexist peacefully in India. So Hindutva has been invoking an ontological insecurity that is the idea of Muslim overtaking their country, idea of Muslim uh, population growth and also influx of Bangladeshi refugees in India which is Hindutva has been successfully connected the idea of uh, national sovereignty and security with the influx of Muslim uh, refugees in India. So this has become one of the reason for the rise of right-wing populism as we see in India these days. But there is a different form of nationalism, we call it Indian nationalism, which is born in its struggle against British colonialism. This Indian nationalism is inclusive citizenship, irrespective of caste, creed and religion. And this particular nationalism has been a part of Indian constitution so far, but there have been changes recently. So in, when we are talking in the terms of right-wing populism, right-wing define people, the people who, the, uh, the people is one who is Hindu, who is born in India. So Hindutva, this fundamentalist group is represented by BJP, Bharti Janta Party, one of the right-wing party and also ISS is another party. So they say 
Only Hindu is the real, uh, real son of the soul and rest of them are the foreigner. So they have freedom to, they have decided to divide people according to their ideology. So according to them, the corrupt elite involves secular, leftist, liberal. Why? Because they criticize Hindutva. So anyone who challenges Hindutva <coughs> uh, philosophy become international, become corrupt elite. For them, Muslim and Christian is a completely other because of the religion. Because Muslim and Hindu uh, Christian belongs, uh, they came from outside. They are treated as outsider because their religious space is not in India. So this has resulted in a majoritarian rule in India. Hindutva forces has been able to mobilize or polarize people on the religious line, telling that that Muslims are invader, they are invading India, so they need to get rid of. So majority of Hindu at the moment are mobilized and they have elected a right-wing leader, Narendra Modi. So this form of uh, populism has been reflected in terms of uh, authoritarian and there is a strong leader that's a Narendra Modi is a strong leader which basically pro, uh, pro, propagate his Islamophobic and he is an anti stabilist anti-elite. So anyone who challenges this particular ideology has become enemy of Hindu fundamentalism. So what are the alternatives? We see these three alternatives, pluralism, syncretism, indigenous nationalism and contextual secularism. I, I will explain pluralism is a system where two, diff, two or more areas grow together. <coughs> Syncretism is a product of amalgamation of different cultures and ideas. And indigenous nationalism is inclusive citizenship, which is irrespective of caste, creed and religion. And conceptual secularism is different from the western secularism. It respects way of life and give space to religious minority in public affair. So using this indigenous way of, uh, uh, I, I don't say a way of life or a concept, government of India has been managing the diverse uh, population so far, but this has been disturbed because of the rise of the right wing population. So I think this model can be an uh, alternative. And this has been populist major recently. CA is the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, which basically uh, this act has a potential to strip Muslim from their citizenship. <coughs> and uh, government has also taken some decision to capture the con uh, complete control over the Kashmir, which is a Muslim majority state. And mob lynching of Muslim has been justified because uh, they are foreigner, they are intruder, and the beef ban. So basically, eating beef is uh, illegal in India. So uh, uh, we can see this kind of uh, right wing populist process a threat to the democracy because they are exclusive in approach. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I will just try to, to explain the reason why I created the African Lisbon Tour. And, um, um, my name is Naki, I'm from Togo. I'm here for almost six years in Portugal. And when I came, I was, uh, I was really impressed, first of all, the African population in Lisbon. That was very important. I was living in Germany and in Spain, and I didn't have the same uh, the same situation. So when I came and I saw the community, I was very happy. But I realized that uh, the, the history of the community is not told. Um, their past is not known. So I tried to talk with most of them, especially in the in the in Rusio, For those who, who know uh, who know Lisbon, so in Rusio you have a, a strong African community. Well, I'm, I just tried to make investigation and talk with them. But most of them have no idea about uh, their own history. Um, basically, those who are from Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, and yeah, so. The first generation of, uh, of the population lives there, they came from the 60s and 70s, so some of them were militaries, and they also have these secrets. They don't, they don't really like to talk about this past, that was very, uh, very, strong, very um, well, hurtful for them. So um, I decided actually to, to try to, um, to give life to their history. Yeah? So giving life to their history, um, 
I'm passionate about uh, the history of the slave trade and also colonialism. So I started making my investigation, especially through Portuguese textbooks. That was very difficult at the beginning because uh, I don't speak any Portuguese. Uh, but with the help of different people like Isabel Castro and Nike for those who, who know her. So she's going to help me because I speak French and she speaks French. Mm -hmm. So she was helping me to understand a lot of things. So this is how uh, the African respond to us. So uh, the idea is, uh, is to complete uh, a, a history. Yeah? Uh, when we say African history is not African history, it's not only African history. It's also Portuguese history. It's a history of everyone. So there is a, this, this history that is told. We have a part of it, uh, the history of the discoveries. And, um, and next to the, history, to, to the history of the discoveries, we cannot deny the one that was the slave trade because everything was almost, they were almost related. Yeah? So when uh, this, the, the discoveries of the expedition started with, uh, uh, with Portuguese going to different coasts of Africa and also Asia, so they're going to start also trading people and this will be the beginning of the slave trade. You're not talking about slavery. Mm -hmm. So we, we just try to, like, to put the puzzle all together. Yeah, because um, as they are not, it's not really represented in the city. You walk in Lisbon, you have a lot of statues, you have a lot of uh, statues of kings or whatever, but you have no representation about the African uh, history of Portugal, so the slave trade. Yeah, the only thing you really have that talk about, <coughs> somehow talk about it, is Padrão do Descobrimento, the discoveries, um, a monument that is in Belém, so this is the only thing you have. <coughs> but if you, you tell this history, you need to say exactly what the, dis the discoveries also made in Africa. Yeah? So this is why I have this African Lisbon tour, and through this also, I would use, I used to say that this is an education. I was educating myself. Because, yeah, um, it's, for, it's weird, but I'm also, I have a root here in Portugal, if I tell you, I have a root in Portugal. Why? Because I'm from a tribe in Togo called the Minas, and Minas on the west coast, the Guinea coast, were also traded by uh, Portuguese. So <coughs> I have my ancestors' uh, roots here. So I'm educating myself, yeah, and at the same time also just trying to, to share with people uh, and also give the word give the chance to everyone to talk about topics that are very sensitive. Personally, I have no sensitive topic in my life. I like to talk about everything because I believe that is the only way I should to clarify everything. Because uh, when we're talking about uh, multiculturalism, we're talking about interculturalism or whatever. So if we don't talk about what was the past, we cannot even understand the, the panorama of, the, of Portugal today. Right? So those Africans who are in, um, in Russia or who are in, in Portugal um, are sort of part of the multiculturalism, but not, uh, in my opinion, they are not really uh, part of the, the interculturalism. Yeah? Because Lisbon or Portugal is known to be multicultural. But those people now to be sort of accepted, their, their culture to be accepted, this is actually the problem. Because this needs to have like a, um, a, a frank, honest, open debate where you and me, from, different, from our different background, from our different uh, origin, we understand each other's culture. This is how me personally can talk about the interculturalism. Without this honesty, without, without this open debate, we cannot talk about it. It will be only multiculturalism. And this is always going to create issues. Yeah? And we're not even only talking about Portuguese and black people or Indian people or Asian people. No, it's even because I, I, I think that it's also uh, uh, about Portugal. So when you take Portuguese from Porto, Portuguese from uh, Lisbon, uh, from Coimbra, mm -hmm. they also need this interculturalism because we are different. We came from different backgrounds. Yeah, so it's important to take this debate to make everyone accept each other because uh, we cannot be one. Yeah, we cannot be one because we have different education, we have different knowledge. So 
if we take the debate of the interculturalism, I think that we can uh, arrive to, um, to a, a better word. Um, so for me, why? Why do you have this, uh, do, do we need this interculturalism? It's because we need to understand and avoid misunderstandings. If we understand each other, we are going to avoid misunderstandings. So that is like the inclusion of each, everyone in, uh, in the life of the other. Yeah? So it's also uh, to understand the other while maintaining a coherence. Uh, we, we understand each other, we understand the other, but we also maintain a coherence in our own culture or in our own way of, of, of life. So it's also uh, to prevent conflicts, because today conflicts are everywhere. Uh, talk about India, how things are working now. If we have this interculturalism, so we're going to avoid those, uh, those uh, conflicts. And also, we can uh, perceive the, the world better and share, uh, share and develop projects together. Yeah, so this is uh, the reason why it's important to go with the uh, interculturalism. So I'm going to stop now. I have a lot to say, but, but we, as we have a question later, so I think we're going to, uh, to share a point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. As usual, my PowerPoint always like stand up from everybody else. I just like color, but I'm kind of thinking that should just go back to black, black and white. Um, so, um, Christiana asked me to kind of comment on everybody else's uh, presentation or like speech, but I think I'm not really good at doing that. Um, and I was trying to take notes and try to understand what every intervention has in common. And it just seems to me that what is the unspoken denominator is history and the past because whenever we talk about interculturalism whether it's in Europe or in India or in uh, other places I personally got my training, academic training in Australia <coughs> this is where I started my academic journey and looking at uh, issues related to cultural diversity <coughs> uh, my starting point was economic <coughs> sense of this reality unless I look at the history of the past so I started from looking at the uh, dispossession of indigenous people in the land mm -hmm. and then specifically my research project I started from the aftermath of the Second World War because um, contrary to what most people think actually uh, because I started my work talking about international education so international education is understood as a phenomenon related to globalization which is something that started in the 90s so interculturalism actually becomes something very famous with talking about international education because it becomes this global phenomenon where most Asian students coming from Asia got the money and then went to Western country to study. But in reality, uh, when you dig into the kind of discourse, and Australia was perfect from this point of view because Australia is the first country where uh, international education does intercultural education, became a policy, a state policy in education. In 1993, the then Minister of Home Education stated as this is what we're going to pursue in education as a way of improving the economy and improve social relations in our country. So, but the kind of epistemic discourse actually traces back to um, uh, the Cold War epistemology. So when I start to, I didn't want to dig into the direction of what I was kind of pushed into it. Because whatever I was reading about international education, we always fall back to intercultural communication. And it was the, the main concept was the intergroup contact reduce racial prejudices, which reduce distance and then improve relation. Like, don't use the word as relation, but what we use is such a relation. But when you dig into the history of the intergroup contact, it goes back to the studies were conducted in the United States uh, before and after Second World War, which was about black and white people and race relations in the United States. And the hypothesis of intergroup contact uh, and all the premises of the kind of related idea stems back to actually um, the big uh, like the Canadian corporation, <coughs> funded, like funding uh, bodies, they were actually giving money to uphold white dominance through um, kind of like financing this kind of project aiming to reduce racial prejudice. So there's a long history behind that. But the thing that I like, um, I found very interesting is how but intercultural communication kind of uh, preach the fact that it's a mutual thing and both parties are supposed to improve the relationship by knowing each other better. I'm sorry, Nadia, I'm going to go against your point. 
but this is exactly what I learned to unlearn. So the more, like, it is idea that knowing each other is going to improve the, um, the social relation, it goes back to people who are trying to uphold white dominance, and is reducing racism to a matter of uh, personal attitude, personal prejudices, and is completely ignoring all the history of, um, of sexual racism and, and all the stuff that we all know. So, so I was thinking, about, so I was trying to understand exactly why is exactly that, despite these premises of mutuality, at the end of the day, are always migrants or the other subjects who are supposed to adapt and not, because at the end in populist discourses, what's happening is like people should adapt to our culture, no more our culture. This is what happens with the citizenship test. And in my history of being a migrant myself, I was always somehow, yes, you know, especially the start of a multicultural society, we have this beautiful country where we appreciate the black mother cultures. But the knowledge of Italian culture stopped with uh, pizza and spaghetti, while I was supposed to know specific things about Australia, but I knew always more than other people, so it was a problem anyway. <laughs> so, but, um, so like I was always looking at this idea that the major is the distance between two cultures, the more people are supposed to have problems, and then I also dug more into the direction, and I found that it comes from the office model of cultural difference, which is dated back to the 80s. And I was, but before the 80s, what happened, and then I realized that most of the cultural communication actually come from Cold War anthropology. So Cold War anthropology was uh, actually Margaret Mead and company, so they were all like the scholars and students of pros, but also was to look at us, the people that actually the anthropology as a single ended like uh, um, uh, defeated racism because it was the first one saying, oh look, you know, society is more important than uh, nature, biology, therefore culture is more important than, um, than race. But, um, so that brought to the replacement of race, the replacement of the constant race with the one of culture. So from that point on, culture became the, the factor discriminating differences in human behavior, and so on and so on, but also became the way to understand, uh, to say conflict is not related to race, conflict stems from misunderstanding. Again, if we know more about each other, we'll avoid uh, misunderstanding, and therefore racism doesn't exist. And uh, the drops, I actually like to look at the drops, was actually most of the Cold War anthropologists wrote about Chinese authoritarianism, which was a, a right iteration, re-iteration of Orientalist discourses about the East. And it goes back, that kind of genealogy goes back to Hegel and so on and so on. So <coughs> the more I was looking into anything, the more I was going back into history. And the more I was looking into history, the more I realized that, please forgive my Frenchism, like how fucked up the history of the culturalism was. <laughs> and uh, then I went, this was the first take, so this was my PhD work. And then as I finished my PhD, moving towards my current project, I started to look at what happened before the Second World War, which was during the colonial era. And specifically, I just realized there was a lot of literature written in the 30s about native education. So it was intercultural, um, intercultural debate about education. So plenty of people wrote about this moment of what is education in the, in the colonial context, both in the Portuguese and British colonies of Africa. And as far as I know, so the French colonies but I didn't look too much in there. So, and then I realized this when I started to get really interested in anthropologists <coughs> like um, Escombitz, Malinowski, who had a personal fight between the two, was very interesting. I started to look at these old anthropologists basically assuming by the <coughs> fact that the moment in which a weaker, more primitive culture was getting in contact with a more advanced, stronger culture by default, the weaker and more primitive culture was supposed to suffer from the contact at a very personal emotional level by being maladjusted. <coughs> so this figure of the native that became cut, like they became exposed too much to Western <coughs> culture, he was that he was maladjusted. He became a suffering subject, a suffer, a subject which could not uh, live, was living between two realities and other of all. And so it was the, the top in this case, because this question was the detribalized native, which was seen by default as problematic, but the reality was that the, so that educated uh, native was a problem because he wants to have more political power in the colonies. But again, like, you know, at that time, actually, was the moment in which anthropologists say, we want to be part of the bureaucratic system. We want to be assisting 
the colonial administrator in allowing the native to adjust to modern European culture. So let us be part of that. And so, as my husband will say, this was the moment in which tribalism started, in which, you know, I think that the concept of ethnic culture has started. But this will be his work. So, at the same time, the same people at the policy were like advocating the kind of discourse in the, um, the colonies in Africa. At the same time, the United States, the same anthropologists were actually advocating the use of the same ideas to migrant population in the United States. And again, Basically, the idea was the migrants coming from cultures which were more distant or different from the Anglo one were suffering from cultural shock, were suffering from the process of adaptation, and it was more of a psychological, moral, internal process of the migrant. So the migrant in question was not the detribalized native, but it was the melancholic migrant. The concept of melancholy actually starts with Italian migrants being diagnosed with some sort of depression and they couldn't understand what we came from and was, oh, it's melancholia. So melancholy is actually related to migrants in the United States. And again, in both cases, the modern reference is cultural contact. So I find it very interesting that the same concept was used to both analyze the relationship with native in Africa that are supposed to be primitive cultures and migrants in the United States. So it was, at one point, those two discourses emerged and became one. So this actually is Eskovitz's definition, because Eskovitz was the first anthropologist to say, let's come up with a theory that put the two of them together. And the moment in which they put the two together, they also completely erased the history of power relations. So <coughs> I'm not going to do too much, but this is actually his definition that I took from one of his articles. And again, just to be on time, at the same time I was like, what well, is this idea of suffering? Why is the weaker culture suffering physically, assumed to be suffering? And then it's very interesting because I do work about emotional and sentimentality, and I realized that this idea of suffering comes from the fact that um, uh, racist discourse is also connected with the idea of, of emotions, the capacity of having an identity that is capable of resisting to the influence of other cultures. So basically, when you are civilized, you are civilized also because you are capable of resisting the impact with the contact with another culture. When, when you are a primitive body, supposedly, you don't have the capacity to filter, process, and reflect upon the impact the emotion caused by the contact, and therefore your culture by default is assumed to disappear because of the contact. So this is where I come up to so far. This is where I, the direction where my uh, research is going to. So I, the final question I want to conclude is um, intervention is like, can interculturalism be traced back to slavery, abolition, <coughs> and a related emergence of liberal sentimentalism, which is my final question that I want to put to us.